So uh, what we thought we'd do tonight is give you a little bit of food for thought with tongue in cheek. Uh, just some things to think about, some things to help you make sense of some of the stuff we all see in the media. We're often, very often, getting bombarded with all kinds of information. Is it fact? Is it fiction? Whether it's on the internet, whether it's on the radio, whether it's in the newspaper. And hopefully, by the end of tonight, you'll have a few more skills in trying to separate the hype from the fact. So I thought I'd start my presentation tonight with just a little bit of food for thought. So obviously people have been thinking about the importance of nutrition to their overall health for a very long time, as this quote's actually from Hippocrates over 2,000 years ago. Garlic is to health as a scent is to a rose. Too much of something is also a lack of something else. To lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. Ben Franklin. <laughs> The destiny of, uh, destiny of nations depends on the manner in which they feed themselves. So, the question that everybody's always asking, does a miracle food exist? The short answer, no. But hopefully by the end of tonight, um, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about why that short answer is no, and give you some information that will help you feel more confident in that you're choosing a healthy diet for cancer prevention as well as optimum health for yourself. So overall, our diet and lifestyle can have a very important impact on our risk for getting cancer, but it's not just any one food that you may eat or not eat. It's your overall diet and lifestyle. And we're hopefully gonna prove that to you through the rest of our talk tonight. So I thought I'd start the talk with going through the recommendations for cancer prevention. Now these aren't just um, things that Michelle and I have pulled out of the air. They're supported by the American Institute for Cancer Research. They're supported by the American Cancer Society. They're supported by the Canadian Cancer Sci Society, as well as some of the European um, programs, facilities that are looking at cancer prevention. So our first recommendation, be as lean as possible without mm -hmm. being underweight. Aim to be at the lower end of BMI. And for those of you that don't know what BMI means, it means body mass index. We're hoping that your BMI would be between 19.5 and 24. So if you're not sure what that means or where you are in terms of your BMI, there's a lots of really easy to find BMI calculators on the web. Um, or if you're mathematically inclined, it's your weight in kilos divided by your height in meters squared. And that number that you wind up with should be between um, 19.5 and 24. Now why is it so important that we're as lean as possible? Because, um, sorry, I have to read my notes. Um, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight not only reduces your risk of cancer, but it also helps make you feel better, and it prevents your risk of developing other chronic diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension. Um, and actually, the latest statistics, cancer's not the biggest killer here in Canada. It's actually heart disease and stroke. So if you can do anything for yourself to help present those risks, as well, or lessen those risks as well, it just overall makes sense that we look at doing things for all three of those conditions. Where we store that extra weight is also very important as well. So uh, being as lean as possible, but making sure that we're not carrying it around our middle, because a lot of research has really suggested that carrying that weight around our middle is actually more risky than carrying it in other parts of your body because it acts like a hormone pump, releasing extra estrogen and extra other hormones into our system, which can um, increase our risk for cancer. Research is now suggesting that carrying extra weight around your middle uh, is linked to colon cancer, possibly pancreas, endometrial, and breast cancers. So what should our waist look like? For women, our waist should be less than 31 and a half inches or 80 centimeters. For men, it should be less than 37 inches or 94 centimeters. So when you all go home and rush out, rush and get out the tape measure to measure, what you want to do is you actually want to landmark two fingers above your belly button, and that's where you're going to measure, okay? Next recommendation 
be physically active for at least 30 minutes every day. So I'm not asking you to join the gym. I'm not asking you to do start training for your next triathlon. What I am asking is that you simply brisk walking will do it, but you have to do it consistently. And if you're not up to 30 minutes right now, then it's something you can gradually work up to. Studies are showing us that regular activity not only prevents the unwanted weight gain, which we know the more weight we have, the greater our risk of developing mm -hmm. cancer, but it also keeps our hormones more at a healthy level, thereby reducing our risk as well. We know that exercise can strengthen our immune system. It keeps our digestive system healthy. It allows us to actually consume more cancer protective nutrients from additional foods without our weight going up. So there's three really important reasons for making sure that we're exercising as much as possible. And obviously if we keep our weight down and exercise more, particularly cardio, we know it reduces our risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. So what do, I, what do I mean? I said brisk walking will do it, but some people will moderate activity. What does that look like? Any time you've raised your heart rate above your resting, and that's easy enough to tell with just your good old pulse check, but you should be breathing a little bit heavier too. You should still be able to carry on a conversation. You're not so out of breath that it's impossible to talk to the partner you're, wa you're uh, walking with or working out with, but you should be feeling a little bit breathless kind of like I am right now, but hopefully that'll settle down in the next minute or two. <laughs> so it's important to set realistic goals because if you, you know, get really gung-ho and you wind up really sore the next day, then it's harder to go back and work up to, like I said earlier, um, slowly to the 30 minutes. And knowing that we're Canadian and we're heading back into the snowy season, it's easier for us to exercise in the summertime when the weather's in our favor. So plan for the winter, plan for what am I going to do instead of walking outside if it's icy, if it's minus 30, if it's snowing like crazy or, or freezing rain. And the other thing is plan whether it's family or friends. Plan an exercise buddy if you can because we all know human nature, you don't want to disappoint family friends. So if you've got somebody that you can call or somebody that's going to call you and say, hey, let's go for the walk even though the weather's kind of lousy, it usually does motivate most of us to get out and, and be physically active every day. And, and not only that, it's a whole lot more enjoyable unless you happen to have a pet who doesn't take no for an answer, like I do. Next recommendation. Avoid sugary drinks and limit consumption of energy dense foods. Especially foods that are processed, they're high in added sugar, they're low in fiber, and they're obviously high in fat. Again, the rationale for this recommendation is to prevent the unwanted weight gain. Um, and the obesity that goes along with it, thereby reducing our risk for cancer, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. So why avoid energy-dense foods? Because based on the last recommendation, most of us aren't active enough to be able to eat those extra calories without gaining the weight. And just to kind of emphasize why energy-dense foods can be a real pitfall for some people, this is about 100 grams of apple. It's about 52 calories. 100 grams of chocolate, the size of two normal chocolate bars is about 520 calories. So for 10 times less calories, a whole lot more satiety, in other words you're going to feel full a little bit longer, you're getting um, fiber, antioxidants, and other important nutrients that are amazing for optimum health. So if you're limiting your energy dense foods, you're also essentially eating a lower fat diet. But Everybody says, okay, then you're telling me I need to eliminate all fat from my diet. That's not necessarily the case. You should be conscious and very aware of saturated fats that come from um, plant, or sorry, animal sources. And you should be considered about, concerned about trans fats that you're going to find in processed foods. So it becomes important to read your labels to make sure you're getting <coughs> lower saturated fats and trans fats from any packaged, boxed, processed foods that you could potentially be buying. But um, it's also important to think about the, sat the other sources of fats. Polyunsaturated fats, unsaturated fats are heart healthy. So the fats you're going to get from some vegetable oils, nuts, um, seeds, and the omega-3 fats that you get from cold water fishes like salmon and trout are all considered heart healthy <coughs> along with ground flax. Again, it's a rich source of omega-3s and it's from a plant source. And soy, the fat you would get from soy products is also considered 
okay in terms of the fat content in our diet. So I've kind of picked on some of the processed foods, but let's think about sugary drinks for a minute. Not only do they typically contribute to weight gain because of the excess calories, one can of Coke has about 140 calories, a can of ginger ale roughly about the same, but re a lot of research, I think it came out about 18 months ago, has shown that the sugary drinks, even though they're very calorie dense, don't fill us up the same way solid foods do, so they actually contribute to more calories at the end of the day. So if you're not getting the same feeling of fullness after drinking a can of pop and then you go ahead and eat, that additional, or that 140 calories again from solid foods, it's easier to gain weight even though you're drinking, you, you think you're, you're not eating solid foods, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. So be very, very aware of the calories you're getting from juices, iced teas, colas, pops, that sort of stuff. Because they don't fill you up very quickly at all. Next recommendation, eat a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes. Diets rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes we know are high in fiber and important um, sources of other antioxidants and phytochemicals. We know it reduce our risk um, of cancer by protecting cells in our body from the damage that can lead to cancer. They're also lower in calories, again preventing the unwanted weight gain. High fiber foods are actually thought to be beneficial and the highest sources of fiber are the whole grains and, and fruits and vegetables and legumes um, because they actually speed up how quickly things move through our gut and when that happens then we're actually decreasing how long the cells in our digestive system are exposed to potentially cancer causing um, carcinogens in the food that we're eating. Um, so a lot of people will say to me when I make that statement, eat more fruits and vegetables, well what about the pesticides? Should I be buying organic? Those are two things that we see a lot in the news and there's a lot of hype around. So what I usually tell, to pe tell people is um, there are tighter regulations in place here in Canada in terms of pesticide use and if you're concerned about it on your fruits and vegetables, um, if you can remove the outer leaves like of a head of lettuce or a head of cabbage, um, for other fruits and vegetables that'll stand up to a good scrubbing under running water, you can remove a lot of pesticide residue just by simply doing that. And if it's um, fruits and vegetables where you're gonna eat the whole fruit and vegetable and won't stand up to a good scrubbing, scrubbing things like strawberries, blueberries, uh, raspberries, you may wanna consider actually purchasing organic for those things. So from my own personal experience, do I buy organic bananas? No, because nobody in the house eats the peel on those. Um, and most of the pesticide residue is going to be there, but will I buy organic strawberries and blueberries? Yes. Um, if you always peel your potatoes, do you have to worry about buying organic? I mean, if your budget can afford it and it gives you that sense of um, peace, then sure. But, you know, if money's tight and you're trying to feed a family too, and you know you always peel your potatoes or you're comfortable giving them a really good scrub under running water, then that's a decision you can make as a family. Maybe sometimes you do, maybe sometimes you don't. But Think about the, the ones that you know you're going to be eating the whole food and ones that won't stand up to a good scrubbing. Limit consumption of red meat and avoid, and I should have bolded the word avoid, <laughs> processed meats. So the latest recommendation is to eat no more than three ounces two times a week of red meat such as beef, lamb, and pork. Everybody's going, oh, Beef's the only red meat. No, for these, the purpose of these recommendations, pork and lamb are also included there as well. And you're going, okay, three ounces. Well, the easy guide is the palm of a woman's hand. is roughly about three ounces and about as thick. Your hand's not three ounces, sir, sorry. <laughs> so you should be looking at your wife's hand. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> There's now very strong evidence out that links red meat to colon cancer we should be looking to avoid completely ham, bacon, salami, hot dogs, sausage, or any other meats that have been preserved by smoking, curing, salting, because all of these processes we know introduce carcinogens into the meat. So you're going, okay, well you just eliminated three quarters of my diet, now what? Well, the reality is, if you're looking at packaged deli meats, thinking, think about replacing them with chicken, an easy example is if you're cooking chicken breast tonight for dinner, cook an extra breast or two and have it sliced for sandwiches the next day. Um, fish is an okay choice as well. Think about hummus, think about 
eggs, think about um, cottage cheese as alternate sources of protein for earlier parts of the day. Most often we should be looking at having chicken or fish um, and maybe some vegetarian choices a little bit more often as well. The other important thing to note is if you do choose to eat meat, whether it's red meat or chicken or fish, we really should be avoiding the charring that we'll often get as we're moving out of barbecue season. You know that those nice grill marks, those crispy edges. We know when meat is cooked at a high temperature very quickly, that charring that we get actually contains significant carcinogens that could increase your risk of developing cancer. So if the meat does happen to get charred, trim it off, don't eat it. Or the other options are if you still really enjoy the barbecue flavor, you start the meat in the house and just finish it on the grill so that most of the cooking is done and you're less likely to get charring and to um, not use the really high heat to um, use a, a lower, slower cook on your barbecue. So don't leave the burners on high and let it get, it up, get up to 600 degrees. So think more along the lines of your oven temperatures and, and let it cook a little bit more slowly or use indirect something between you and, and the meat or sorry, between the meat and the, and the flame on the grill. Okay. If consumed at all, limit alcoholic drinks to a maximum of two a day for men and one a day for women. Obviously the best advice is not to drink at all, but there is some um, research out there that suggests a little bit of alcohol consumption, like red wine, can have some heart protective effects. There's convincing evidence that alcohol increases our risk for um, all sorts of cancers, particularly mouth, uh, larynx, pharynx, esophagus, um, breast, and colorectal cancers uh, for men, and possibly colorectal and liver, liver cancers in women. It's felt that alcohol can directly damage our DNA, therefore increasing our cancer risk, especially when combined with smoking. So I know it's not one of our topics tonight, but an important recommendation is that that's not diet related is that we should not be using any tobacco products at all because we know there is a link between tobacco usage and increased cancer. So just to be clear, a drink is considered to be one bottle of beer, so 350 mils or 12 ounces, or five ounces or 150 mils of wine, or one and a half ounces or 45 mils of a 40% alcohol. So the rice, the, the um, rums and the vodkas. Next recommendation, limit consumption of salty foods and foods processed with salt. Too much salt increases our risk for um, stomach cancer and they think directly by damaging the lining of the stomach and we also know it puts, that, puts us, easy for me to say, puts us at risk for high blood pressure. So how much salt is too much salt? We should be looking at limiting our sodium intake to between 2,000 and 2,400 milligrams per day. So if you're not sure what that looks like, my advice to you is most of the salt in our diet comes from processed foods. So the, you know, the, the pasta side dishes, the rice side dishes, um, canned soups, frozen pizzas, um, any sauce that's canned or jarred or bottled, frozen meals, snack foods, like the potato chips that I picked on here. So even if things don't taste salty, they may have a lot more salt in them than you think. So please check your labels. Most of them will give you a percentage as well as a number of milligrams. So just kind of keep that ballpark in your mind. If you're shooting for 2,000 milligrams a day or 2,400, if you're eating three times a day, you're looking at about 700 milligrams for a meal. If you're eating a little bit more often than that, maybe then think about 500 for a meal and a couple hundred for a snack. So it adds up very quickly. Even th thinking about things like breakfast cereals, you'd be amazed at how much salt are in some of those, which we don't perceive as a salty food. And the final recommendation before I turn over to Michelle is don't use supplements to protect against cancer. And I think you see that in the news a lot. So choosing a balanced diet from foods and eating from all the colors of the rainbow that represents Canada's food guide, we know gives your body a whole lot more phytochemicals, nutrients, vitamins and minerals. And we're really just beginning to understand um, the interactions between all of these that are coming from whole foods rather than just the straight supplements. And as the Food for Thought mentioned at the beginning, we know that too much of one thing from a supplement can actually sometimes 
take the natural balance out of our body and maybe more benef or harmful than beneficial. That being said, knowing that we're living here in Canada, um, the only supplement I do typically recommend, and I recommend that you talk to your doctor about this first, is a vitamin D supplement, particularly when we move into the winter months where we're not getting the, the daylight hours and the sunlight exposure to actually develop the vitamin D within our skin. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Michelle now and let her talk about other aspects of cancer prevention. Hi everyone, um, thanks again for coming. Just like Jackie said, it's nice to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, so as Jackie mentioned, there's a lot of uh, recommendations that have been listed uh, here from Canadian perspective, also from the American perspective. You have handouts that you would have picked out out front and everything that Jackie and I are saying are in those handouts so you didn't have to be uh, taking lots of notes. Uh, one of uh, Jack and our favorite topics and what we deal a lot with here in the Cancer Center is a lot about myths and misinformation. So I'm sure all of you go online, I, I wouldn't have to even put my hand, like put your hands up to tell me all the things that you read online. Um, we've been, I think I've been, I've been asked everything. I don't think anything surprises me anymore, but I put the highlighted ones that I get asked probably on a daily basis. So hopefully I'll be able to clear it up for you. And of course, in question and answer period, you can always ask me some more about it. So I always ask, uh, get asked about sugar-free. Do I have to avoid sugar? Does sugar cause cancer? And I'm sure all of you have heard this too. Um, so hopefully I can clear this up. So I'll just put this all up for you. So sugar feeds every cell in our body, not just cancer cells. So we have to feed our body, our mind, and carbohydrates, which consist of not just uh, like starches or cookies or breads also comes from fruit and also come from dairy. So to say that I'm not going to have any sugar, you'd have to take all those things out. And I'm not sure what I would eat if I took all that stuff out. And uh, giving more sugar to cancer cells doesn't speed up their growth and it doesn't deprive, depriving them from sugar doesn't slow it either. So everyone's looking for that quick fix to see if that's going to help out. But even healthy cells and cancer cells, they, they grow whether you're breathing, whether you're eating, so there's nothing you can blame particularly. But interestingly enough, that eating too much sugar indirectly raises cancer risk. And I feel that maybe that's where things got twisted around and people just read those big headlines that Jackie put on in the beginning and they just gravitate to that and maybe misunderstanding where it's coming from. So what is a safe amount? Um, so Jackie mentioned about the sugary drinks and the donuts. Who's not gonna have a donut? Who's not gonna have a sugary drink. We all have our weakness. Um, and these are the recommendations to have no more than six teaspoons a day for women, which is about 100 calories coming from these simple sugars, nine teaspoons a day for men. Um, and most Americans, uh, North Americans, if you can see, eat 22 teaspoons, and that's just on average. So it's amazing. I, I know that in our introduction, they mentioned that I um, help out in the school council and work with healthy school lunches and healthy school program and it's amazing how misinformation about this could be a healthy product but how much sugar our little ones are getting to um, so hopefully this information will be helpful for you to take back to your family and and your grandkids and try to give them some some good guidance what's interesting with the sugar too that i'll mention is that sugar also comes from good sources not just candies or jelly beans or like sodas they also come from, like I said, carbohydrates, like your whole grains, like our cereals, fruit, even protein and fat. So all those things have good, healthy sugars too that we need for our brain to function. And what's important to note is that if you pick higher fiber, which I know Jackie's mentioned and I'll go into a little bit later, what it does is that slows the way that our sugar is absorbed in our body. Therefore, our body doesn't have to produce as much insulin to deal with all that sugar. We're still looking into the connection between sugar and insulin in our body and how it reacts. Um, but for now, you know, we're just saying for you to watch how much that you're eating for the sugar, um, simple carbs, but the good complex carbs, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, like the whole grains, like the beans, like the lentils, those are going to help you feel fuller faster, help with your weight, give you lots of fiber, and therefore reduce the, your pancreas producing more insulin. Another one I get asked, and Jackie gets a loss, is detox diets and cleanses. I'm sure you've read a whole bunch of things or been told by family, oh, you have to try this cleanse for three days and get rid of all the toxins out of your body. But lucky for us, we all come with a liver. Um, so that helps to do that too. So we don't have to go and spend all this money doing these cleanses. So we've heard some crazy ones, 
But these diet claims, they, they claim to rid all these toxins to your body. You become clean slate to start over again, which I have friends, this is a very funny story, who did all these cleanses, and then they went out for a burger. So I'm not really clear on what those last three days did. But it facilitates weight loss. It's supposed to flush out fat. It's supposed to remove cellulite. That doesn't happen. Decrease body odors and bad breath. I think that's brushing your teeth and taking a shower. Uh, cure nausea, headaches, fatigue. We had one of our patients here in the center who was told to do a cleanse, and if they started vomiting, it's working. Like, these are ridiculous things. Our body has the natural, like I said, like our liver, our kidneys, so lucky we all have those things. So typically, you'll read that it comes with these two type of things you need to do at home, some herbal concoction you're supposed to make in the kitchen with some awful green thing mixed with something else. And then a diet, which just you have to like watch other people eat and just drink water. Um, this one's my favorite, colonic irrigation. I don't know who would want to do that. But we had a patient who said they were told to put coffee grinds up their other end there to help to eliminate toxins, which I'm not sure I'd want to do that. Um, and obviously there's no evidence to support this. I've even reached out to the, you know, the naturopathic world to ask, like, does this even work? And they're like, no, it doesn't. And also be quite dangerous too. You don't want to be putting anything up on that end that you're not supposed to be putting up there. So uh, I wouldn't recommend those things at all. Uh, the alkaline diet, Jack and I get asked that all the time. So people, it's under the assumption that you can control how much acid's in your body and cancer loves acid and that's how it grows. So this is the, the premise of this diet. But I don't know how you can change the inside of your body. It already has its own acids and they're there for a reason. So people start eating all these things to think they're making their body basic. But what happens is, and I, again, I, I did reach out to the naturopathic community and ask them, you know, what do you do? So what they do is you have to pee in this little cup and then you put the little strip in and it says, oh, yay, you're basic. So then you're, of course, going to be cancer free. But really, you're just changing the pH of your pee. Like it's not changing of your body. So it's not possible. Everything's tightly regulated and it's you just can't change it by eating a lemon, which apparently is on the basic list. So um, I wouldn't buy into these diets either. Um, so then I always get, so, so what am I going to eat? My husband asks me that all the time. So I just say, you know, sliced apples and eat nothing else. So he always laughs at me when I tell him that. Um, so research shows, and as Jackie was mentioning, that there's not one thing that's going to help us to get can not get cancer. There's not one magical thing. If there was, then I would know we would be billionaires and everybody would not have cancer. So there's nothing. So what do we do? There is such strong evidence to be following a plant-based diet. Um, I'm not suggesting you all have to go home and be vegetarian, but there's a lot of evidence not only from the cancer world, but also from the diabetes world to help control blood sugar and help have a healthy diet. So hopefully I can help you navigate this and, I, and um, the, obviously the guidelines you picked up on the handouts too will describe this. So what we're suggesting is that you have good fruits, you have those whole grains, you know, those complex sugars that I was talking about, uh, lentils and beans. Um, seeds and nuts, those are a great source of protein. Um, and they all have been shown to help lower cancer risk. And there's a lot of plant foods that are low in calories, which are also gonna help keep your weight in check. And that ultimately, when no matter how many research papers Jackie and I read, and I'm sure your physicians and nurses and family, it's all pointing towards weight. And healthy weight is, is a healthy life, right? And I know everyone's looking for the quick fix, but your weight didn't come on those 30 pounds in, in you know, a day, and it's not gonna get off in a day. Um, so it's gonna take some time, but it's not, there's no diet that's gonna work. It's gonna be changing over time. So a little more about the plant-based diet. So typically you would see the first plate over here is normally what we hear people might be eating. What we're suggesting is that maybe now switch that little pyramid of like meat, potatoes, and vegetables, and make more two-thirds of it more plant-based. Um, and, and think of meat as just like a side garnish, not as your whole, uh, your whole plate, which is very hard. You know, my whole family's South American. I'm like the black sheep of the family. Everyone is, a cow slows down just enough they're eating it. So they look at me in horror when I make these suggestions. Um, but using beans and lentils and um, more of the legumes for protein is really going to help you to get your protein needs which also helps you know, help your immune system be strong, but also make you feel full for longer with smaller portions, which will help with the weight loss and uh, a good BMI. 
So eating five servings of non-starchy vegetables and fruits every day, you're probably thinking, well, how am I gonna do that? Um, and I have a little, you must have seen this little food guide before. And you can find this online too if you want. There's even create my own little food guide that you can do with your kids and they can pick little fun things and use this as their shopping list. You can go online and get that. But there's really quick things you can do. So when you get up in the morning, like as soon as you have like some frozen fruit or fresh fruit, just eat a little bit, half a cup, you're already done, one serving. And then maybe for lunch you have a little bit of spinach or you have a little piece of, piece of fruit or the apricots for snack. It's gonna be done in no time. And by you eating these things throughout the day, instead of going for that, you know, three o'clock coffee break with a donut and replace it with the dried apricots, you'll feel better, you'll feel good about your decision, and then overall you'll be um, moving towards this plant-based diet. Um, eat whole grains and legumes. So this is where those good sugars are gonna come in, the ones that are gonna <coughs> slow you down, slow, make you feel full, full faster, less <coughs> insulin release and make your blood sugar more stable over longer. Even if you're not diabetic, you can still have blood sugar changes throughout the day, and that could really affect you. You might find like a headache, or you might think, oh, I'm hungry, but really you're thirsty. But if you're eating things that are more on a low glycemic index, which means a low sugar index, which you can also um, go online, even on the, uh, the website for Health Canada, they have those listed you'll feel better and more even blood sugar throughout the day. So picking more of the wild rice, the brown rice, quinoa, oats, those kind of things. All bran, even bran buds, um, you can sprinkle on your salad. I know my husband like rolls his eyes when I make that suggestion that he should sprinkle bran buds on his yogurt. Um, you know, chickpeas, lentils. From a heart healthy perspective, I also teach the cardiac bypass class and it makes recommendations for having beans and lentils at least three times a week. Well, I do it at least three times a day. So you can have them like little snacks and a little Tupperware, or you can stick it on your salad or put it in your soup. It's just, it's that easy. Like you don't have to think of this entire vegetarian life and how you're gonna cook and bring out this cookbook and spend all this money. It's really, really quick and easy. You can make these changes. And eat vegetarian meals several times a week. Um, so even if you have like a meat meal, you can definitely make that meat portion smaller like the plate I originally showed you. And then just add like more of a bean salad or a stir fry. There's so many options. And what's great now that with the online world, like if you go in, you know, all recipes or just put on Google, you'll get like tons and tons of easy recipes that you can find to do at home. Um, of course, more fruits and veggies. So what I do is like if, if they're not available at home, like no one's gonna eat them. So what I, if you buy a big pepper or you buy like lettuce or celery, just cut it up already and like put it in little baggies so it's easy to grab so they're done. So it's not the excuse of like, oh, that thing is not cut up. I'm not gonna even open that refrigerator. Just do it already cut up so it's really quick. So as soon as you come home from the grocery store, just like cut stuff up before you put it away and then it's already ready to go for lunches. So there's no excuse why they shouldn't take it with them to work or to school. Um, even with scrambled eggs, I can like, you know, make it a little omelet or make it a fun experience for everyone at home and pick a new vegetable to try and then just add it to the food. Um, pack low sodium vegetable juice, like a V8 has a low sodium option, option to pick. Uh, we do lots of smoothies at home, like you could do uh, bananas and buying frozen fruit is much more economical, especially as moving into the winter months. And, um, you can make a whole bunch of varieties and try, and we have smoothie challenges at home who can make the better smoothie. So you can make it more of a fun experience. Oh, bran muffins for sure. Um, I even made the horrid black bean brownies, which was a success for the most part. So you can try all these sneaky things to hide stuff in. So going back to what Jackie started, is there a super food? There's no like one food. The super food is all these foods. It's all the plant-based diet. It's following the guidelines. It's putting a little more effort into creating a shopping list and looking at things. Eat Right Ontario is a great website if you wanna go on. They have menu plans for seven day menu plans you can look for, shopping list they create. So they make it very easy for you. There's a vegetarian option too that you can pick. Um, so our main take home message is follow the recommendations, eat well and often. So the more, like if you skip meals, you're more likely to overeat at the next meal and that will eventually lead to weight gain. Um, there's no, you know, you have to eat every three hours, every four hours, just eat often, eat good food, eat things that you enjoy. Cause if you're eating things you don't enjoy because you read it online somewhere or, you know, aunt Millie told you to have this cleanse, you're not going to do it. So just find things that you really love to do. Um, be active, 
do anything, like park further away from the grocery store. Like we all take the stairs here. We had like a stair challenge here. I didn't do very well, but there's the stair challenge. Um, there's lots of little things you can do. Find joy in the little things. Like if you have a dog, like go for the extra walk. You know, the mailbox is there, go the extra long way. You'll feel good about yourself and then it'll motivate you to do even better. And these are just our sources. And so these are things you can go online too. So all these are really great. Um, that's a really good alternative um, site if you're looking for complementary medicine or some ideas because our patients always want to know those things. Uh, of course, the American Institute for Cancer Research. That's where we got so excited that we get to go to Washington. Uh, the BC Cancer Agency is a really great website. Um, this AICR is I recommend it to you because it's really uh, user friendly. It's not just for health professionals. You can navigate lots of recipes and ideas. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society is great too. This MD Anderson is excellent, and of course the Mayo Clinic has really good resources that you can like print out, um, and you can on the search engine. It's really user user friendly. And that's just some of our references that we used through this presentation. And yeah, we're up to our questions now, so you can feel free to ask Jackie anything. <laughs> didn't talk about it so that's a good question I'm not a huge fan of almond milk just because there's like only one gram of protein in there right. so I think that's like the new sexy milk to try like like before gluten-free is a new like new fun thing to do um, studies have shown I was looking in terms of a breast cancer and a, and a dairy the only relations they were showing for um, estrogen positive breast cancer women are to have lower fat milk choices there's no evidence that's linking directly your choice of having dairy and you're getting a reoccurrence of breast cancer or getting breast cancer. This, the evidence that is out there that's kind of rising in terms of prostate cancer is trying to stay below 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day. That's about two servings of dairy products a day will get you that. That's for the prostate uh, group. Um, like again, like Jackie said, like new things are coming out all the time. Um, but in terms of you avoiding dairy as a way to get rid of cancer, there's no evidence that's going to show you to do that. So having low fat choices is a great source for calcium, for bone health. You don't want to start eliminating stuff and then end up with other issues. So by low fat, you mean skim milk? Skim milk, yeah, 1%. Um, picking yogurts that are 0%. And what's interesting with the 0% products, what I mentioned in my, in my bypass class, is that when you pick zero fat things, they add a little more sodium to it. So just be mindful of the packaging because if you're trying to stay with that 2,000, 2,400, you just want to have a good balance. But in terms of a heart healthy cholesterol point of view, you want to stay in the 0% world as much as possible. And think about the cheeses too. So if you're looking at buying a cheese, you're looking for 20% milk fat or less. So the, the full fat Havartis and, and some of our fancier cheeses tend to be higher than that. So look for the lower fat alternatives and, and watch your portion size. Um, that's a serving of cheese, the size of a woman's thumb. I have it so rarely that yeah. I let myself have it. Like, yeah. yeah. So in a month. But yeah. yeah. And the other thing about milk alternatives is just make sure that they're fortified with calcium and vitamin D because almond milk is not as rich a source of calcium and it doesn't have any vitamin D in it. So most of the products sold here in Canada do have to be, if they're being sold as a milk replacement, like soy milk, almond milk, rice milk, are fortified. But if you're thinking that you're getting the calcium and vitamin D that you would be getting from cow's milk, just read your label first and make sure. Okay? Uh, just on that topic, I noticed that uh, my wife asked me to have some almond milk the other day, and I read the label and it said it had 7% salt. Um, it could be. It's probably like normal milk is about 110 milligrams of sodium per cup. Like nothing's really sodium free. Even a raw tomato has 20 milligrams. So from, I love that your wife forces you to do that. That's so funny. Um, but the almond milk really, you know, it, they, they, program, they push it as a 35 calorie product, help with weight loss, but you're missing so much protein there that I think it's going to affect the overall satiety of you feeling full. So I think you might end up still eating more calories, even though you're having that low calorie 35 uh, you know, drink from the almond milk. So you don't have to go and buy any special things. Just buy lower fat products. I do have a question on sweetness. Do, do uh, sweeteners cause cancer? Like uh, aspartame? There's a lot of hype on the net. Um, I know, basically, I think sweeteners have a place in um, the diabetes world for sure. 
but I also feel that again everything in moderation so just because it's a low calorie alternative doesn't mean you should be eating um, you know it at each meal a day so I usually challenge people to retrain their palate for less sweet things so if you're the type of person that was used to drinking three sugars in their coffee maybe you need to think about how sweet you were drinking it rather than just putting the equivalent in terms of sweeteners so there are some recommendations the um, uh, the Center for um, Interest in, I can't think of the name of it right now, they publish a, a magazine every month and they have put recommendations in place in terms of limiting your aspartame servings or your artificial sweetener servings to no more than three per day. It's on the diabetes website too, um, if you wanted to look on it. Sorry, You're right, Susan, it is. Yeah, yeah. She said the Nutrition Susan Action said. Health Letter. Yeah. So thank you. And also um, on the Canadian Diabetes uh, website, they have guidelines in terms of how many milligrams per kilo would be a safe amount to have for aspartame um, with those sweeteners. So that's a really important guideline, especially if you're thinking about children having diet products or products sweetened with artificial sweeteners, is you're not going to be looking at an adult recommendation of less than three servings per day. You can actually be looking at their weight because they're so much smaller. So um, go check out the website for those recommendations if you are using um, artificial sweeteners. I think. If it's a quick grab-and-go lunch, I'd rather see you, or something that you're going to supplement your diet with throughout the day, I'd rather see you doing a, a juice than grabbing a pop for sure. Um, but you know what, there's a whole lot to be said about the enjoyment we get, get from eating the, the real food. And again, we don't know 100% the relationship of all the different nutrients that you're going to find in the different foods, in the whole foods. We don't totally understand that relationship yet. We know there's a lot more research that needs to be done into that aspect. So would I switch my entire diet to juicing or rely exclusively on juicing to make sure I'm getting my phytonutrients, my vitamins, minerals? No. But if you're using it as possibly a replacement for some of the sugar, sugary or drinks, like, like pops and, and um, things like that, then it's probably okay, you know, a couple servings a week sort of thing or even a serving a day. You mentioned that you're missing the fiber, and that's the key to that satiety feeling of feeling full. Because that's if you're drinking the juice, you're still getting the calories, you're still going to be hungry. I can tell you, if I have like a little smoothie, I'm much more hungrier a couple hours later than if I had something that had more protein and fiber in it together. And the act of chewing and eating, it makes me feel full, like more satisfied. I'm not going to go for that extra snack, and then I can't reduce my calories. And you had a question, sir? Well, um, from a heart healthy perspective, um, olive oil and canola are the two oils that we would recommend. Um, and in terms of like an omega-3 and the flaxseed oils you're talking about, those kind of things. From a heart healthy perspective, of course we'd want you to have um, good oils and cook with less of it, right? So it, your thumb is what I want you to cook with and not frying in those oils. Even if they're healthy oils, they're still fat and the fat has carries far more calories um, than a carbohydrate fat or a protein fat. Um, so even if you're cooking with those oils, you still want to monitor how much you're doing. A flaxseed oil has a good omega-3 source as a vegetarian option for those who are looking for those omega-3, which are like those blood thinner type of um, oils. And also fish, like uh, Jackie was mentioning, has a good omega-3 too, like the salmon, like the Arctic char, anchovies, those kind of things. Um, but still with frying and baking and using all that oil, you want to limit how much fat you're using. So sometimes I play around with those oils. If the recipe calls for like a whole cup, maybe I'll try three quarters and see what happens. And I try to finagle the fat that way. I also get asked a lot in my um, heart healthy world and also in the cancer world about uh, margarine versus butter and those kind of things. But from a heart healthy point of view, um, butter has carries a lot of saturated fat, which is um, contributes to cholesterol. So you're looking for non hydrogenated margarines would be your your best option. Uh, you don't want things that are hydrogenated. So when you look on labels, for example, peanut butter, um, there's gonna be two different kinds of Kraft or Skippy. So one will say just peanuts, like exactly those words on the ingredients. And then the other ones will say sugar, salt, hydrogenated vegetable oil, hydrogenated coconut oil, or par partially modified, you'll see all these things. Those are the ones you wanna avoid. So anything hydrogenated, you wanna stay away from. And obviously you want as low saturated fat as possible as well. Okay? Yeah, Sandy. Um, 
Can you guys touch on these uh, energy drinks and these vital waters and stuff like that? Do you guys recommend those to people that aren't eating properly? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, no. Um, typically when you get into the Vita waters, there's typically some sugar added for the flavor as well because, so what I usually tell people is if you're looking for, if plain water is not appealing to you, look at flavoring the water a little bit more naturally with things like a wedge of lemon, a wedge of lime. Um, I know it's in vogue in some of the restaurants in Toronto, a couple slices of cucumber tossed into the water. Those are much healthier options for flavoring your water than um, buying the, the vitamin water. And if you think that you're gonna meet your body's vitamin and mineral needs by drinking a couple of these a day, wouldn't it be so much more fun just to eat some fruits and vegetables or have a salad at noon? There's so much more variety and texture and flavor there. So, um, and in terms of the energy drinks, like are you thinking like the, um, the Red Bulls and things like that? Yep. Um, there's definitely some health risks associated with those. Um, I wouldn't recommend them for the young athletes at all. Um, we just don't know. I don't think they've been on the market long enough to really understand the long-term impact. Mixing them with alcohol has had some catastrophic results. People don't realize how drunk they are, and the next thing you know, they're, they're in hospital with alcohol poisoning. So I wouldn't recommend those at all. Um, I, I guess as an advocate of overall healthy lifestyle, if you're feeling that tired in the middle of the day, maybe you should be looking at as Michelle's been talking about, balancing your diet out a little bit better so you're not getting that mid-afternoon, late-afternoon kind of feeling of low and fatigue and looking at your sleeping habits as well. Most of us try and get through the day, get through the week on, on six or seven hours a night and maybe your body's telling you that you actually need seven to eight hours a night and just adjusting your bedtime if you can to, to make sure you're getting your body's needs rather than having to rely on these sorts of things that we don't know yet the long-term impact of. Besides that, they're pretty pricey. Last time I checked, they're like almost three bucks a piece, aren't they? And, and more isn't better. Like yeah. more isn't going to save you from getting cancer. More is not going to help you have the fountain of youth. Um, so people always think more is better, and especially our cancer patients as they're going through treatment and also in survivorship, they think mm -hmm. the more they take these multivitamins, and some say take two, three a day, um, you're just going to be peeing it out. So it's just a waste of money, and it's just not, it's not going to be helpful. I think that's one thing people do have to keep in mind. Most of us would be eating, if you think, seven days in a week, three times a day, that's 21 meals. So, you know, if you have one meal where it's less than perfect, that doesn't negate the, res the effects of having 20 really good meals. So don't beat yourself up about being human and, and enjoying some time with friends. But as much as possible, these recommendations we know will reduce your risk of developing cancer. Thank you for all coming in and hopefully you learned a lot, so. <laughs>